Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to The Health Show here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alastair Greener, and to what will be our last episode of this series. Now, in this series, we've been welcoming health experts within their specialised field to discuss prevention of health issues or concerns that you or your loved ones may face. We've looked at how you can change your health and lifestyle for the better. And if you'd like any further information on today's programme or any of the topics we've discussed throughout the entire series, then please do get in touch at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Today, we're going to be looking at the importance of calling NHS 111, a free helpline for any medical concerns that we may have. It's estimated that each year in London alone, over 768,000 people who could have been helped by NHS 111 end up going to A&E. And we are now all being urged to avoid unnecessary trips to A&E by getting help from an enhanced NHS service, which now offers a wider range of clinical services than ever before. This includes direct access to advice from GPs, nurses, midwives, pharmacists and specialists in mental health, cancer and child health. It's a real pleasure today to welcome our guest, Dr Matty Woodhouse. Now, Dr Woodhouse is a doctor at Penn Medical Centre in London and she's going to share some interesting information about the NHS 111 campaign. Dr Woodhouse has been a GP in Harrow for over 10 years and has a medical background in respiratory medicine. She's also the clinical lead for diabetes in Harrow and her interests are specifically around disease prevention of any form. Dr Woodhouse, thanks so much indeed for coming to the Thank show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Lots to talk about and very excited to hear about this enhanced programme. But we're going to come back to that in a moment. But before we do talk to our expert more, let's take a look at a short clip which encourages us to call NHS 111 for the right medical attention when we urgently need it. Depending on the situation, the NHS 111 team can access a nurse, emergency dentist or even a GP. And if necessary, they're also able to arrange face-to-face -face appointments. So let's take a look. NHS 111 is much more than a helpline. If you're worried about an urgent medical concern, we're here to help. Call 111. Depending on the situation, the team can connect you to a nurse, an emergency dentist or even a GP. Call 111. Should the team think you need it, they're able to arrange face-to-face -face appointments. Call 111. We can assess if you need an ambulance, and if you do, we can send one directly. Call 111. The right medical attention when you urgently need it. First of all, great again to see you. Thank Thanks. you so much for coming in. And this whole campaign is about raising our awareness of NHS 111 and why it's important. And we got an idea from the mm -hmm. clip there. Yeah. First of all, let's get real back to basics about NHS 111, where the idea started and why we actually have it. Well, it was, I mean, there's a massive um, pressure on A&E services at the moment. Primary care is also under a lot of pressure. Um, and I think the neat, the sort of rising pressure placed on A&E with patients having difficulty getting appointments for simple ailments meant that that pressure was just continu continu has been continuing to rise and it still is. 111 was initially created to try to provide some sort of access to healthcare advice as a first port of call if you were unable to get an appointment with your GP. Um, and you know, since then it has gone on and become much more advanced and developed, which is one of the things we're promoting today. And looking at the campaign, because I'm aware that the actual NHS 111 has actually mm. been around for quite some it time. Has, yeah. um, and it did, being, being honest, it had a little bit of a bumpy start in the beginning. How has it changed and developed over the years? So um, I agree, partly. I think um, initially it maybe had some teething problems and perhaps you, I think like with anything it's evolved and developed and we've um, learnt from where we could improve and errors that maybe have happened and now um, with the enhanced service we've got much more access to areas we felt were understaffed so I think a lot of patients feel like they should have had direct access to a clinician, for example, which now is a possibility. And also, you know, access to other healthcare professionals, as you had mentioned earlier, nurses, pharmacists, paediatric nurses, mental health care workers, you know, m a much broader range of 
p clinicians to get information from to deal with maybe minor non-urgent conditions. And of course that's part of the campaign to make yeah. sure we all understand that these people are actually there. So how much has that changed from maybe because it, it's a little bit like A&E. We don't go there every day. We don't necessarily access no. the service all the time. So for somebody who maybe accessed it before the enhanced level, how much different is this? How much more is there there now? So initially 111 has was um, something where you had a set of questions a non-clinical person would ask you these and based on a set of red flags that may or may not have been alerted based on the clinical assessment um, the call handler would have directed you somewhere so whether that was to a GP to A&E directly or giving you simple advice over the phone but now I think the questions are a bit more fine-tuned and also there's a better system in place to triage patients for many things that happen that lead people to go to A&E departments. So simple things like children with temperatures who, you know, where this, of course it's worrying as a parent to have a child with a fever, but historically the, these things shouldn't be turning up in an A&E department. These can be managed perfectly well in the community in primary care. So now I think we have access to paediatric nurses and GPs perhaps which as a parent with your child at 9 p.m. at night rather than bundling them up and carting them off to A&E you can now get some simple advice and have clinicians talk you through. Previously perhaps it, it wasn't that there was a clinician there so that probably left a bit of anxiety for the patient or the parent. So hopefully with these services we can provide safer and more comprehensive care for a And that's range. the real key, isn't it? Because it, everything is about trust. Mm. You know, it's no coincidence that no. all of our hospitals are part of trust. And it's about us trusting the system yeah. and recognising that actually the people you're going to get put through to, the people you talk to are experts within their field. Yes, exactly. And so that's basically what we now have access to. And... Talk me through the process. If I call 111 right now, mm. what's going to happen? Well, you'll start off with a an, an admin person who will take basic information, basic questions about your physical health and background medical history, perhaps any medication or allergies, and a sort of general understanding of what the problem actually is. Based on that they can streamline you into the appropriate avenue to manage your problem. So for example, sometimes um, patients are going to A&E because they're on medication for say epilepsy. So there is an anxiety about missing medication, you know, unless, you know, on a Friday night, your GP's closed until Monday. So a lot of these individuals are going to A&E departments to get their medication for two days. And this is something that can be handled by a GP on the end of a phone. Can we can electronically send prescriptions to local pharmacies, which can be dispensed. So, you know, the evolution of technology means that we can actually do a lot of actually administrative work much faster. And, you know, the campaign in particular is targeting those that have been seen to be attending A&E when they could have been managed in the community. And research shows that actually um, that those the two main groups seem to be parents with children under the age of five and also young adults somewhere between in their sort of 20 to 29 range. But to be honest, having worked in A&E departments and also now being a GP and our surgery is also a walk-in centre, I can see actually it's all, it's all manner of problems that are actually, you know, ending up in A&E departments when they shouldn't be there. And we have capacity in primary care to actually manage that and 111 services l help link that. That's really what the key is with the enhanced service. It's linking the services that already exist. So there have always been out-of-hours GP services. They were just never closely tied and connected with what the 111. And often, let's be honest, most of us, you know, we only think about this when it happens. We, you know, lots of us don't know where our nearest pharmacy is that's open 24 hours no. or we can get the medication. We don't know whether there's a GP we can go to immediately. And there's this tendency to go straight away to things. Looking at people who do turn up at A&E, mm -hmm. people who aren't phoning 111, because I presume you'd like to get 111 to be in our brains as much as 999. Yes. It, yes. It's almost... Sort of, 
in our DNA that we understand that's yeah. what we do. And obviously that's what the campaign is all about. What are some of the reasons that you find that prevent people from calling it? What's holding people back? What are the misconceptions or the common misconceptions that people might have? I think a lot of people don't know about 111, first of all. They, or the, the, there's been a misunderstanding about what it can actually offer. I think they know, they sort of think it's a number you call for something very, very simple. I don't think they understand that actually behind that initial administrative person lie a whole fleet of clinical staff that can offer and manage your conditions. So, you know, GPs are very much associated with 111, the out of hours GP service. But, you know, uh, midwives, paediatric nurses, pharmacists, dentists, you know, all manner of um, clinicians are, are there to help with that. And I think, I don't think people realise we can issue prescriptions, we have access to certain aspects of patient records to be able to know what medications they're on. Um, so I think just the belief that 111 is not more, is a bit more than just, a, you know, a phone number that you ring and sort of dish out information about your name. And, and there's no question that's probably the case. I mean, until I started preparing for today's show, I wasn't aware there was quite so much that um, they could actually help you with. Yeah. And obviously, again, calling 111, is it like 999 in terms of it's free from any landline, any phone? Absolutely. You just pick it up? It's free um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, around the clock, from free from landlines, mobiles, um, and yeah, just I think we just encourage people to use that and perhaps think if they do have a condition or a simple minor ailment to perhaps ring up and get some simple advice over the phone for, as their first port of call. A and E is really accidents or emergencies, of which the vast majority today are not, unfortunately. And I do understand, as a GP myself, the pressures that are on primary care services and hospital trusts. We all see on the news keep beds and rows and trolleys and trolleys of people, you know, in corridors. Um, so I just think it's not the appropriate place. It's being saturated by you know, patients who, who don't need to be there, first and foremost. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because we, we all, you know, get frustrated at times and we're definitely not going to get into the politics mm. of funding the right. NHS, but we get a bit frustrated sometimes that maybe we can't get what we want when we want it. And we do have this sort of instant attitude as a society mm. now and we become very, very demanding yeah. and forget that actually we ourselves might be clogging up the system. Yeah. I think that, that's one of the main reasons I'm doing the promotion mm. because I, I do think we all have a responsibility to utilise services appropriately and, you know, part of this promotion is really to help people understand that there are um, adequate and appropriate services in place to help people non-urgently. Let, let's clarify this and make it absolutely mm -hmm. clear for everybody because at the at the moment we now have effectively um three four routes we can go to we can call 999 we can call 111 we can go to our gp make an appointment or we can go to a and e in fact there's a fifth one we can also go and see a pharmacist mm -hmm. What levels are we talking about in terms of where we should be calling or using? Because some people might get a bit confused. You know, I've got this particular situation. Am I going to the pharmacist? Am I going to the doctor? Am I going to the A&E? Am I calling 111? Am I calling 999? Yeah. Do you I have a, like, a, like a scale, as it were, of what <laughs> well, we do? As a clinician, yes, we have a scale. But as the patient with your abdominal pain or vomiting or high temperature, I think it is all just using a bit of common sense as well. Of course, there's a bit of anxiety around being unwell and what that really means. But, you know, minor things, your pharmacist can review you. But I think if it's something a bit more like a fever, diarrhea and vomiting, a cough or a cold that's not going away for more than a week or, you know, something like that, that kind of thing really should be managed via 111 I think you can get some good advice there and actually the whole point of the triaging system within 111 is that they can step down or upgrade you know based on clinical need so 111 also are able to dispatch an ambulance to a patient if after assessment they deem that necessary they can book you in to see an out of hours GP or they can alert your local GP practice you know there are many many different avenues to it 
of course, I think if you've got severe chest pain or absolute difficulty in breathing or something like you're hemorrhaging, of course, that's directly to A&E. But the, the other things in between probably can be triaged by 111 and then the next steps taken appropriately. And that's a really nice thing to know, isn't it? That that's almost like your first stop, um, you know, unless somebody is in danger of, of dying or, or severely um, deteriorating, mm -hmm. then call 111, they can help you. One of the interesting things you talked there about was making appointments. They can call an ambulance if necessary. Mm -hmm. You can speak to an expert straight away. Is there a way of, you know, because sometimes people say, you know, I get really frustrated. I know this is something I need to see my GP about, but actually I can't get in, depending where you live in the country, for maybe a few weeks, a month or, or whatever. Can this process be accelerated by going through 111? I think if you have a pressing issue, physical or, you know, a medical issue, um, you can probably get some basic advice and information immediately via 111. And probably after that clinical assessment, you as the patient might feel happy to wait perhaps the two weeks that your GP is requiring you to. Or if it is deemed necessary, they might see you in a sort of out of hours capacity or in a walk in centre. So there's a lot of different options there. Yeah. And one of the things which is quite interesting is this whole thing that, in theory, if we all use 111, it'll take pressure off actually. Definitely A&E, but also possibly our GPs as well. Yes, I think so to some degree. There's, and, and we all communicate, you know, between us, you know, all, all the services communicate. But I do, yes, I do think a lot of minor simple things can be dealt with as a one-off consultation with a doctor or nurse or clinician. It doesn't necessarily need your actual GP. And, of course, the great thing is you don't have to worry about missed appointments or anything like that. You just pick up no. the phone and you, you're, you're through to someone straight away. What about calling on behalf of other people? Um, for example, if you call an ambulance because somebody has just collapsed or something, you know, it, it's taken, you're, you're there. What about 111, calling on behalf of other people? Does it really need to be the person? And if it's a parent or guardian or maybe just the babysitter, mm. you know, what's the process there? I think anybody can use the service if they're concerned about somebody else, not just themselves. Um, but it usually will require you to be present with the patient. So you probably couldn't call about someone who was no longer there because it does require some physical parameters to be reported to the administrator when you're making the initial call. But anybody can call. What would you like all of us to do now, apart from obviously use 111? Yeah. <laughs> how can we get this message out? This is obviously a campaign that's been thought about very, very hard. Mm. And you're clearly trying to make sure that everyone across the whole country is absolutely aware of this service. What can we do to help you? I think the NHS is a wonderful organisation and system. I think we're very blessed in this country to have a system like this. And we all need to take responsibility for preserving it. Um, things are changing. And of course, there's never enough money in the system. <laughs> However, with the right sort of men with the right approach and attitude, I think we can have something that operates quite smoothly. So for all the viewers, I think it would really be just to really think about their symptoms and how serious this genuinely is, really, and decide what you're going to do before you sort of step out of your door and decide you're walking over to the local A&E department. You know, really, really think to yourself, could, could I actually speak to somebody on the phone and just get a, a quick rundown of my situation before going to a department? And not only are you taking pressure off the health service, actually life's going to be a lot, lot easier for you and less stressful. Yeah. <laughs> We love hearing examples where people have actually, you know, maybe even had their lives transformed or they, they, it's just great success stories because we really relate to that. So have you got any you can, just a couple, just before we go to the break, that you could share with us? Well, I mean, a lot of our... Um, so an example would be perhaps a lady, a young lady, a patient of mine um, with mental health problems, for example, was, you know, attending A&E very often because usually at night, her, you know, her mood would, you know, she would, she would become quite low and, and take herself off to the local A&E department for some help or input. And there wasn't really anybody there to support her in those moments, which is difficult as, as her GP, I'm there in the day, but I'm not there at night. So I think 
now, I mean, she had a lot of A&E visits, so we sort of sat down together in a, in a consultation and I explained to her perhaps she could use 111 and there are people there to talk to her about that. And so she has, I mean, she's, she has used 111 a lot over the, over the time and now she doesn't go to A&E. But also I think what it's doing is encouraging her to manage her illness herself, also her thoughts and low mood and things like that. So she's able to contain it better because she knows the day will come and she can get through to her GP. I mean, that's the story is great. And actually, I'd like to talk a little bit more about mental health in this second half, because that's always a topic that people are very, very aware of. And especially at the moment, we've got a huge awareness campaign, thanks to the Royal Family getting in, in, involved with that. Mm. Just before we go to break, final tip about 111, your main reason why people need to be calling that and how to cement it in our minds. First of all, remember 111. <laughs> um, I think just, you know, just try to look at your symptoms when you feel that you need urgent medical attention and really double check, triple check, question whether a hospital waiting for four hours is going to resolve that for you or whether this is something that can wait or, you know, just have some simple advice over the phone and utilise the other services that are there. You know, I think there's hesitation if it's not a doctor in the hospital, it's not good enough. But, you know, there are lots of clinicians who are so well trained now um, that can help you with this. And we really need to understand that they are equally as capable as managing these conditions. And it's that great thing, you know, triage, if some people aren't familiar with the term triage, the fact that you can get that instant help there and then. Thank you so much for the moment. We're going to go to a break, but um, lots, lots more to talk about. Now, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems whatsoever or have any health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. It's now time for a short break, but don't go away. We've got lots more to talk about and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Health Show, where our topic today is NHS 111. Now, NHS 111, as we've already said, is more than a helpline. It's a free service available 24-7, and fully trained advisors will help us all get the right medical attention. Here's a reminder. Again, that really does enforce this whole message. Call 111, don't call 999 unless you really need to. Yep. And likewise with um, A&E, accident emergency and things. One of the questions I did want to ask is that a lot of our viewers, English isn't necessarily their first language. They might struggle um, with certain terminology and things like that. How can 111 help them? Absolutely, and that's been recognised as a big problem in the past in the process of developing the enhanced service and now we have um, a very broad range of translators available around the clock to help in a multitude of languages so that should hopefully eradicate any problems related to that. So literally you'll be put through to someone who actually speaks your language so you can feel a lot more comfortable? If there is availability at that yeah. moment, if not they have other translation services to help navigate yeah. that. 
I mean, that's and that is amazing that, um, you know, you've got specialists who some of them will maybe mm. speak the different yeah. languages yeah. as well. And especially the more common languages within Britain as mm -hmm. well. I mean, that, that is phenomenal. Mm. Now, one of the things that I'm really interested in is this whole referral process that you were talking about earlier on. The fact that they can refer you to your GP and say, actually, that's something you need to go to that. Actually, no, we'll call an ambulance for you straight away or so on. One of the things you did touch on earlier on with the 111 centre what exactly are they? They're not, um, it's not, it's not a 111 centre, it's an urgent care centre or a walk-in centre, which okay. are, there are several of them, you know, you know, there are lots and lots of them around the country and they are sort of another stepping stone beyond your local GP service. So they are operational within hours, usually 8am to 8pm. Some of them are open longer, some of them overnight. They, it varies from centre to centre. But if when you're, you're being assessed by a, tr a call handler, if it's deemed that you might benefit from a clinician assessing you face to face, they can use, they can often book in slots for you um, at a walk-in centre or they can just direct you to your local one. Now, obviously, where you're calling is very different to the 999 service, mm -hmm. I presume. Yeah. Is there any connect between them at all or are they completely different services? They're different services, but they access um, the London Ambulance, oh, sorry, the Ambulance Service, I should say, um, in exactly the same way. So just as when you dial 999, they push, put you through to the Ambulance Service, 111 can also do the same. It's quite intriguing how this works, because when you imagine as a national service, you know, you've got, is, is it just one call centre? Have you got numerous call centres? Are people being routed to potentially all over the country because you have access to computer screens that give you all your local information wherever the call handler or professional is? How does that all um, actually work? There are many call centres and I think the databases are connected. So, you know, they're all linked together. You can have access to all the information you need. It doesn't matter where the, call, the centre is, really. So you're so actually the person you, you're speaking to might be your call handler in Manchester. Then you're speaking to a dentist who's in London, and then you might be speaking to somebody else somewhere else. But of course, that doesn't really matter because all the no, information is all available exactly, on the screen. Exactly. So the computer system must be incredibly powerful to be able to access not only your information, uh, but also all of the information of the various help that's available to you. It is a massive sort of database of lots and lots of clinical resources, I would say. So pharmacies, electronic prescribing, dentists, midwives, nurses, all the local hospital trusts. It is, it's a massive um, network of information feeding from one place to the other. But it, you know, I think that's probably why initially in the past one one has had problems because that connection system wasn't understood. Sometimes you have to do things to understand where you need to build bridges and connect pieces of information. And also as technology develops and enhances, you know, things change. And so we have, we're just adapting with that. One of the things that people are often concerned about is their medical records. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that you would have access to these medical records of various individuals or is it just done basically on a the information you give the call handler yeah so there's no access to patient records at all it's completely um separate but if a, an individual has called 111 in the past we would keep a log of the previous calls so you can build up a, a record of a person's history also um your gp may alert 111 services of a patient's medical problems, medications, and things like that, or any useful information that might be of value to the 111 team if a patient is perhaps calling often. It's useful for them to have this background knowledge. But it's not but actually... your patient records are not um, accessible at all. Right. Um, it's just really what the... Pa your pa the main circumstances are if your GP feels that this information is useful. So that would be many medication or certain medical problems. So terminally ill individuals, um, palliative care patients where things might be deteriorating and we really don't want them to be calling up 999 and an ambulance arriving because their place of choice to pass away may be at home. So actually it's useful for the call handlers to know that this person is 
for palliative care and, and management is sort of manage, is performed appropriately. So very much a, a separate system, but working hand in yeah, hand. Yeah. And it, it, it's, I mean, to me, I'm just amazed something like this exists to this extent. You know, uh, we talked earlier on about mental health. Mm -hmm. The training that, or tell me a bit about the training that the staff must have to go through, because mental health is incredibly complex. And to be able to be able to respond appropriately, I can imagine is quite a challenge. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm a big advocate for anything to do with mental health. I think it's been just generally underfunded and under-resourced for so many years. And it's good to see that more investment and um, importance is being placed on this area in particular. The call handlers are trained in all sorts of medical areas. I mean, they are not clinicians, they are, but they're able to ask questions which are built on a network of, you know, a questionnaire that has been developed by clinicians to help pinpoint where the problems are and alert red flags, so areas of concern. Um, with that information, they are passed on to an appropriate psychiatric clinician. So that might be a mental health worker, a social worker, you know, someone who can manage things, you know, in and, hand. And if the person is, because obviously, as you said, the call handler isn't a clinician, if you get put through to a person who actually probably maybe isn't the right person for mm -hmm. you, which, let's be honest, can happen, yeah. then, of course, you can always get rerouted, I presume, from that uh, clinician yeah. to somebody else. When yeah, they definitely. actually do a further assessment, actually say, you know what, you really need to see this person. Yeah. And I will put you, I will get that sorted for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one of the main things with mental health is that there are a lot of um, out of hours services that exist, but often are not, no, not when many people know about those. So a lot of these individuals have in mental health crisis or members of family looking after people who are suffer, suffering with mental health problems, end up sort of turning up in an A&E department. And that's really not the best place for them to be in the first place. And there are much better suited environments for them to be managed in. And so, you know, that's one of the big things that one, one, the enhanced service does. It allows access to, you know, it just pin directs people to the appropriate place, really. I do find the whole concept just an amazing resource that we can all use to get that initial bit of help and yeah. to get that sort of almost peace of mind to know that actually we're going to be directed to the right person at the right time and all from our home or wherever we mm. are. And again, just to repeat, I think probably the third or fourth <laughs> time we've done it, it's an absolutely free service available to absolutely anybody. Yeah, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, translators present um, in many languages and just, you know, encourage everyone to consider that first before dialing 999 or walking into a payment. How new is the enhanced service that we're seeing, about, hearing about now? Is, is that a fairly new it upgrade, is. as it were? Yes, it's been in, the, in recent months and I think the campaign to promote the service started in a couple of months ago. So a lot of people won't be familiar no. with this and certainly the degree to which they can get mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Again, we talked about some stories earlier on. That was phenomenal hearing about um, that patient of yours who had mental health issues yeah. and how she, effectively, I, you know, not only is she much better for it, but also the fact that she's not turning up to her local A&E. And if we just replicate that through lots more people, what a difference it could actually yeah. make. Yeah. Do you have any other stories of where people have actually been really helped by the 111 service and has actually caused them to have a lot less um, fear and panic and frustration, if you like, of yeah. having to work out how to get anywhere else? Probably uh, I've had several um, parents with young children who panic um, as their child's temperature hits 40 degrees and it's the middle of the night as it usually is. Um, and I think just having, um, being able to speak to clinicians and getting some simple advice over the phone and having someone talk you through. So for example, being given the advice to, you know, just give simple paracetamol, ibuprofen, keep the child cool. And also then the clinician calling the parent back a couple of hours later. So this might be 10 p.m. followed by a call at 1 p.m. You wouldn't get that as easily in an A&E department. So I think, you know, you're not up, uprooting the child in the middle of the night and actually you're keeping them at home and managing them. And I think just having that ability is just 
to support a parent through managing that is just giving them then the confidence to do that. And I've had a number of parents who just build confidence because the problem is when they see perhaps their regular GP in the day, things have improved. And so they're not getting the right sort of management advice when they're seeing the GP. So I suppose these sorts of talk, you, a bit of handholding is available mm. and sometimes that, that's necessary for people. And it does sound like this is, you know, almost chalk and cheese to what the uh, previous system was, which, you know, like every other system, it has to start somewhere, mm. it has to mm. build from somewhere. And obviously it was a little bit maybe on the basic side to start off with, but this new enhanced system, what kind of confidence can you give people in the new system, the fact that it is really working, that all of these lumps and bumps that were maybe in the system X years ago when it mm. first came out, that it actually does work and you're going to be fine? I mean, it has, it, it has such a good array of clinicians, I think, in areas that were sort of not really considered in the past. So mental health is one, dental care is another, um, paediatric nursing support, um, is another important one and access to pharmacies. It, it does make a difference. I mean, patients of mine who don't have medication are actually able to manage that themselves at the weekend because they've called 111 and I've then received a letter on Monday morning telling me that my patient has accessed additional medication because they ran out over the weekend. So I think it, re it does work and I th I'm hope we all hope in the NHS that with time we will start to see a reduction in the numbers attending A&E and also just people having more confidence to self-manage simple conditions. And the resources that all of these clinicians and call handlers have, I presume this is just a, a massive database of out of hours pharmacies, of GPs and, and so on. They don't have your medical records, but they will have everything wherever you're calling from in the country. They will have access to your local resources. Yes, exactly that. Um, it is working, it's working mainly on postcode. So instantly you can see the pharmacies that are open late or walk-in centres that are local to you and um, you know crisis centres and various resources that are available it's all accessible by computer. How did you get involved in the campaign? You're, you're a GP obviously uh, this campaign working well will take um, you know hopefully a little bit of that excess strain away from you as well as the A&E departments throughout the country yeah. but how, how did you wind up getting involved? <laughs> I am, um, I, you know, I am very much for, as you said, health promotion and just helping people become empowered to manage them, their own physical conditions or medical problems. And I just really think it's important that we all understand and take ownership for preserving the NHS where possible and just utilising services appropriately. I think a lot of money and time and anger is spent by lack of awareness and knowledge of what services are available. So I, I just feel it is important to help people understand and promote what we do have. And understanding is a massive part of it. I just want to go back to the service itself for a second, um, because we do live in this instant gratification society. Mm -hmm. and we do tend to be a little bit, well, it's all about me right now, and we forget that actually there's a bigger picture out there, which is, which is fine. I mean, that's the way, way of the world these days. Tell me a little bit about the training that the call handlers will get to be able to deal with someone who maybe is panicking. They um, may be getting slightly hysterical about something. They're just about to call 999. There must be a massive amount of training to be able to identify the traits that people present with. Definitely. I think um, the call handlers go through a program of training um, to deal with all sorts of medical, psychiatric problems. and. I think it must be very distressing at the moments to be a call handler because if you're faced with someone panicking or you know very very concerned it is difficult to get the useful bits of information out to help triage a patient so it is difficult for them I, I feel for them at moments but you know they are um, they're definitely hard trained to pull out urgently unwell people that would probably be the priority there so anyone that really should be in A&E or 999 should be called the red, um, we call them red flags, but you know, these sort of parameters which are sort of concerning are highlighted quickly and pulled out. But yes, I mean, they are, they're following a crib sheet of questions primarily, but I think just the experience of 
navigating a conversation or calming somebody down, you know, is through probably experience as well. And does, what type of feedback are you getting from your patients when, because I presume sometimes you say, you know, I, I mean, are you even tempted to say, you know what, you could have just called 111, that would have actually solved that. Um, oh, I know you're, you're, in a, you're in a caring world <laughs> and you don't really want to turn people away, but um, are you involved heavily in educating people that come to see you? I think as GP, as a GP, we, that is our, one of our primary roles and we definitely do promote services such as 111 all the time because of the amount of knowledge that exists within that service. You know, it, it doesn't always need um, something beyond that. Um, I was saying to you earlier that um, with my, the surgery I work in, we are a walk-in centre as well. So we do see patients that have been referred to us via 111. So they're not registered with my actual practice. and. You know, the vast, I, ha, I have never seen somebody who has been referred by 111 who should have been in A&E. So, but I've been, a, we've been able to manage them in primary care, which is fine. So in a way to know that gives me confidence that they're not sending people who are very unwell to an urgent care centre when they should be elsewhere. So I think the pattern of questions and triaging system the, at the ground level does appear to be effective. And it is a case of just getting this message out over and over again, which is why you're here today yes. and why the campaign exists. And the fact is that this campaign or the NH, NHS 111 has been around some time now. So hopefully people are gathering a little bit more confidence in it to actually start using it. And that message is getting through to the grassroots. Do you, do you feel that? I think so. Um, I think it's more apparent in some groups more than others. So I think um, younger adults are probably not using it as much. I don't think the awareness is there, which is definitely why we're pushing and encouraging people to do this. But part of it is also the time it takes to shift people's cultural beliefs around health care and what the mod how their mod the model of care that they believe they should receive and what we're trying to achieve today, sometimes they're not congruent. So I think it is slowly shifting. And I think as waiting times increase and the news, there's lots of things about the pressures on A&E departments. I think people are understanding why we need to shift slightly. I know we've mentioned it numerous times throughout the, the, the show. I just want to really wrap up with your final bullet points about NHS 111, why people should use it, why they should be spreading the word to everybody else and why it's so important for all of us that people do use it. So the main thing to know is it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You just dial 111, completely free, landline, mobiles. Um, it is for, you know, it's really for any major medical health problems, obviously not urgent ones, but most other medical ailments, queries, any time of day or night, I think, you know, you should be calling this number for advice as your first port of call. There's a broad range of clinicians available. So we've mentioned nurses, doctors, pharmacists, paediatric nurses, midwives. Um, there's translators available for those that don't speak English and, you know, really to understand that they can give you basic advice, but also book you an appointment with a doctor, call an ambulance, issue a prescription for you. There's a broad range of things they can do. Brilliant. What's not to like? Hopefully that <laughs> message has now gone across. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr Matty Woodhouse, for coming on to the show and telling us all about the importance of calling NHS, remember the number, 111, <laughs> uh, which, to remind you, again, is a free helpline for any medical concerns you may have. Once again, though, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. If you'd like to find out anything more about this or any of the subjects we've talked about on this show, then please do email us healthshow at islamchannel.tv. And with that, we've come to the end of our second season of The Health Show. Over the last 20 episodes, we've covered a huge range of topics from gum disease, prostate cancer, skin care, cosmetic surgery, as well as weight loss and mental health issues.
We hope that you have found this alternative viewpoint interesting and useful. If you'd like to catch up on any of the episodes you may have missed, then please visit our website, islamchannel.tv. Goodbye for now, and we'll be back very soon for our third season, so watch this space. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.